Welcome to the second installment of our series of Wednesday Noontime Celebrations of Family Meals Month. I'm David Fikes. I'm the executive director of the FMI Foundation, and I get the honor of serving as host today. Uh, in just a moment, I'll introduce today's presenter, but let me attend to just a couple of protocol matters first. First, first is to remind you to please respect FMI's policy of adhering to antitrust laws that govern the competitive system in our nation. Uh, if any questions take us into the verboten uh, areas of price fixing or market allocations, our product or service uh, provider boycotts, we will quickly cry those as being out of bounds and move on. Uh, I don't expect we'll have any of those issues today, but I did want to provide you with that reminder. Second piece of protocol is to ask you to please use the chat feature on the Teams platform to submit any questions, make any comments, or share any pieces of advice with us. I'll be monitoring the chat room uh, during the presentation and we'll ask your questions during the allotted Q&A at the end. One of the real joys of getting uh, to promote family meals throughout the year, uh, but especially in the month of September, is that it's such an embraceable and positive topic that it frequently attracts new partnerships, uh, new collaborations, and new groups that are interested in helping uh, to advance the message of the numerous physical and mental, emotional, and nutritional benefits uh, that accompany family meals. These new partners often and bring a new energy, a fresh perspective, um, and a new value to that joy of family meals. Each new partner brings a new angle to the prism of family meals, and therein a new color is revealed for us to celebrate and enjoy and explore. This has been especially true this year with our partners partnership with American Heart Association. They've brought uh, new insights to bear and they've cast uh, family meals in a new color for us, uh, evidenced by the fact that we had originally planned uh, to jointly produce one infographic together, but it was such a burst of synergy between the two groups that we ended up with something like five new infographics for our supporters and our partners to use. Um, now, in addition to uh, keeping our respective graphics departments very busy. We're very glad to have AHA participate uh, in our webinar series with us today, and I'm very pleased to welcome our longtime friend Cheryl Toner uh, as our presenter today. As a registered dietitian, Cheryl has some 20 years in nutrition policy and research and communication expertise. And over the years, it's been our privilege to get to work with Cheryl on a number of projects. And I've learned to respect her thoughtfulness, her integrity, and the high quality of her work, and especially her great sense of humor. Uh, it's been our great fortune to have Cheryl appointed as American Heart Association's portfolio lead in nutrition, where we quickly noted that her work there dovetailed nicely with our work with family meals. She is not just a professional advocate of family meals. She is a personal practitioner as well. I know you'll be both inspired and enlightened by what she shares. So Cheryl. Thank you so much, David. That was such a kind introduction and uh, those feelings are mutual. I always enjoy working with you and Tom and others at, uh, at uh, FMI and FMI Foundation. Um, so I am also super excited to, to be speaking with you all today about family meals and the mind-heart-body connection. Um, we at American Heart Association are um, very excited about um, this whole area of work and, and thinking about the total health of the, the person that we're looking to serve, the people that we're looking to serve. So with that, I'll jump right in and give you a little bit of grounding and how we got to the place of talking about this mind-heart-body connection. So our 2024 impact goal with the American Heart Association states that every person deserves the opportunity for a full and healthy life. Um, we are champions for health equity um, and we are really working, everything that we do is really centered on advancing health equity. To do that, we have to think beyond the physical health of a person and think about the, the full person. Um, the, their mental health, their physical health, and the environment in which they live and operate. Um, and we know some of the challenges to health equity are that people do not always have equitable access to all of the factors and all of the, 
the opportunities that can lead them to better health. So we really are working, and, and the way we think about health equity is that it's a state that would be achieved if all people had a just opportunity to be healthy. So this slide shows the focus areas that we are really um, uh, prioritizing here at the American Heart Association so that we can drive equitable health impact. And there's a lot on this slide. We affectionately call it the peacock slide, uh, but we are going to focus today on the green. So you'll see over in the bottom right that one of the core focus areas is healthy living. And within that, we've prioritized improving nutrition security and building mental well-being. And when we talk about nutrition security, we really are talking about both nutrition or diet quality and food security. Um, when it comes to, to building mental well-being, I'd like to dive into that a little bit more because it's a topic that a lot of people haven't heard as much um, on from AHA. Let's see if I can, I meant to advance the slides, but it's, let's see. Okay, there we go, I'm, I'm good. So a full and healthy life from our impact goal is more than just the absence of disease. It's really about well-being and, and really well-being is the value or worth that a person places on different aspects of their life. So it's gonna include being satisfied generally with their life, not being overly depressed or anxious, um, having a feeling of fulfillment or purpose and, and really being able to function well. Something that um, really cannot be ignored in today's climate is that it includes being financially secure or having a, a feeling of being financially secure. Sometimes that's not directly tied to income um, and there are, there are ranges, but it's about how we feel about that financial state. And when we look at where Americans are at today, over the past decade, depression and anxiety among children and adults almost and that is not even taking into account the COVID-19 pandemic. CDC uh, reported that in January of this year about four in ten adults reported symptoms of anxiety or depression and that's four times higher than the numbers who reported this in June of 2019. So really big changes there and um, and Mental well-being is a health equity issue. We know that like the prevalence of heart disease and stroke, the rates of depression and anxiety are not equally distributed in the population. There are substantial differences in mental well-being outcomes based on age, gender, race, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And we know that social determinants of health are woven into these differences in how people experience mental well-being or not. Um, one of the areas that the American Heart Association has really renewed our focus on is structural racism and how that has caused generations of people in historically marginalized communities to experience chronic stress. Um, and discrimination can be a source of day-to-day -day, um, really chronic toxic stress for people um, on along a wide range of different um, you know, uh, characteristics depending on the communities that they live in, the places they work and more. Um, so I've included a couple of statistics um, um, on this slide, um, but simply to note that there are disparities and they are consistent with what we see in cardiovascular disease incidents. So earlier this year, the American Heart Association issued a scientific statement um, published by Levine et al. It's entitled Psycho Psychological Health, Well-Being, and the Mind-Heart-Body Connection. And what this paper really dove into was the evidence that shows that our psychological health, our systemic bodily factors and conditions, and our cardiovascular health are all interrelated. They are, in fact, interdependent. So when a person has a high sense of well-being, they typically have a lower risk of heart disease and many of the um, conditions that are associated with heart disease, like blood pressure, um, and some of the things that lead to heart disease, like diabetes. Um, they all, we also see that um, a lower sense of well-being is related to increased risk. So this is, you know, in general called the mind-heart-body connection, that we really need to look at that total person in order to help um, improve their health and reduce um, those health disparities. 
So I'll just dive a little bit into what we mean by, you know, psychological health. Negative psychological health that can increase your risk for cardiovascular disease includes things like depression, chronic stress, anxiety, anger, or hostility, um, a general sense of pessimism and dissatisfaction with one's life. And that's the one where I was saying, you know, well-being is about how you think about your life. Um, in some cases, a person could have lots of stressors, but have a general satisfaction with their life. They have more of an optimistic viewpoint. And that kind of gets into the positive psychological characteristics that we see associated with a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. Optimism, a sense of purpose, um, gratitude, resilience, positive um, you know, thoughts, happiness, mindfulness, and then this capacity to regulate emotions effectively. One of the things that the paper goes into is, is really focusing on treatment of cardiovascular disease um, to include treatment of mental health challenges, disorders, what have you. So really calling on doctors who treat cardiovascular disease to screen for and, and help to help their patients to navigate uh, care for these psychological challenges that they may be having. And some of those things may include things like you know, medications, um, psychotherapy. The paper does not go into great detail in reviewing some of the, the great things that can be done from a preventive standpoint um, to help a person to improve their psychological health. But there is attention given to um, the social determinants of health and the environment that a person lives in and how that can positively impact their health. What I found really interesting about this paper, and maybe you will too, is that there actually seems to be causal links between the psychological health of a person and the biological processes and behaviors. And some of those same biological processes and behaviors have been shown to contribute and in some cases cause cardiovascular disease. So I'll focus on some of the behaviors, which is relevant for our conversation today, um, which includes healthy eating or unhealthy eating. So whether the, the psychological state is positive or negative, you can have positive or negative impacts on all of these behaviors listed. Smoking, eating, physical activity, body weight, taking your prescribed medications, and then going for preventive screenings. So we asked the question, are family meals good for the heart? Well, this particular paper, as I said, does not really dive into family meals in particular. But, you know, when you look at the literature related to family meals, there are numerous studies out there. We always need more research, right, on different aspects and different ways of looking at this. Um, but an excellent um, review um, uh, that included some meta-analysis. It was a systematic review completed by Robson et al. 2019, um, found that family meal frequency is associated with some diet quality measures like increased fruits and vegetables, um, but also importantly, a lot of family functioning characteristics like connectedness, cohesion, and communication between parents and children. Now, it did not find strong associations with overall diet quality and some of these other um, characteristics of an unhealthy diet, like sugary beverages or um, excess desserts or fast food consumption, um, but they, they did find the association on fruits and vegetables. So then the question's been asked, and really looking at not only the, the dietary impacts, but also the, um, the, the mental well-being uh, uh, findings of this paper, they ask if the family meals are contributing to or the result of good family functioning. Are you know healthy families going to sit down to a meal more often, um, or do they actually help each other out? And there are some psychological um, uh, and sociological uh, thinking out there that sometimes it is a circular feedback that starts to happen with behavior change. Um, that sometimes the very thing that you need to do more of, just practicing it a little bit makes it a lot easier, but it also has feedback benefits for other areas of your life. And so it may be a chicken and egg <laughs> sort of thing, um, but it does, it does beg the question, if you're seeing these associations, how can we do more research to really dig into it more and understand more clearly what's happening? 
Um, there also are some family meal uh, realities um, that I think it's important to, to take into account. Um, we know that time is a commonly named barrier to cooking in the home. Um, so stay at home policies with COVID-19, we did see um, they helped people uh, to cook more at home. And actually, um, these, these uh, uh, findings were pulled from a, a study that was conducted in 38 countries around the world. And, and so lots of interesting findings from different, different communities, different places, including the United States. <clears throat> and so I think we all know that people were cooking at home more, not always cooking healthier, but it, it would seem to be variable. And this study found that psychological stress actually could be an enabler, like get people into the kitchen more often. But for some people, particularly for women compared to men, it could be a barrier to getting in the kitchen and cooking more often. So knowing what that person's usual role is and kind of what the family dynamic is might give us some clues as to how to utilize family meals to actually create opportunities for better, better health. Um, but also just informing how we talk about family meals. Um, and so I'm gonna touch on that a little bit more in a moment. Um, and then finally, they noted that it was the sense of financial well-being played a role as well. And interestingly, um, women in particular, when they were more worried about financial well-being, would be a bit more thoughtful about what they were going to choose and actually ended up making healthier choices. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Sometimes you think if you're worried, you just kind of say, I'm not going to worry about health. I'm just going to get dinner on the table. But at least for women in this in these um, uh, various places that were surveyed, that it actually had the opposite um, effect. I do want to take a moment, as I mentioned, there are disparities related to mental health and well-being, and we know that those disparities exist for cardiovascular disease and for food insecurity. So at AHA, we've been asking ourselves for people experiencing food insecurity, um, you know, are family meals a solution or an additional stressor? Is eating healthy? Um, a solution or an additional stressor. I have heard from more than one person that if a person's experiencing food security, the last thing we need to be worrying about is, you know, good nutrition. That's a, that's a luxury. Um, but I argue the opposite, that it's a, a, even more important to talk about good nutrition. Um, but how we do it is important. Um, we really want to provide solutions that save people time and money. I mean, we want them to taste good. People aren't going to eat things no matter, you know, what's going on. People aren't going to eat food that doesn't taste good and, um, and food that they can't afford. So they need to have solutions that are straightforward, don't take a lot of time, um, that um, don't cost a lot of money, and that promote good health. Um, we want to aim for progress, not perfection. And, you know, our dietary recommendations at the American Heart Association, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, for some people feel um, aspirational and just too hard some days, you know, and it's not about being, you know, achieving perfection. It's about, you know, hey, can I get more fruits and vegetables in this meal? Can I switch to a, to a whole grain? What's a, what's a simple way that I could do that? You know, maybe I don't have time to cook brown rice for an hour instead of white rice for, you know, 15, 10 minutes. So what, where can I make a trade-off? Maybe it's whole grain bread because that's something I can switch and it's not going to take me more time in the kitchen. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can look at, you know, giving people stepwise solutions. Um, I think about folks who, who have SNAP and WIC benefits that they, they shop with, you know, so instead of saying, hey, people who use SNAP, here's some solutions for you. It's more about, hey, anybody who's on a tight budget, you know, let's be ready with healthy, quick, wallet friendly solutions, because let's face it, most people go through at least times in their lives where they have to be more, more careful with their with their dollars. Um, and that frees up their money for other essentials in some cases. Um, you know, and there's a lot of other great ideas out there that I would love in the discussion time to think through because I, I do think we see that there's a connection between family meals and um, better diets and mental well-being. And we want to, we want to, but we want to take into account the reality that there can be some barriers, and we want we want to help people overcome those. 
So just a couple of more slides here I have to share with you is that at the American Heart Association on heart.org, um, our Eat Smart page um, this month is de dedicated to, um, and really throughout most of the fall, will be dedicated to family meals and really thinking about um, helping people to understand that connection between family meals and good nutrition and mental well-being. Um, we have conversation starters up here on the right here where you can have several little bit dinner cards. You can print them out or you can have them on your phone um, and conversation starters for the table, recipe ideas. Um, and then David mentioned the great infographics that we've developed. Um, I will say that we are so fortunate at American Heart Association and so grateful to FMI for having um, some great infographics already um, developed that we were able to co-brand with them, but also really um, excited to have these two on the ends here being our newer infographics that we created together that incorporate more of that um, mental well-being message from the AHA statement. Um, so I am going to stop there and um, just say thank you again to David and Tom and Stephen and everyone for having me come and present to you and would love to hear your questions and any discussion. Thank you so great. much, Cheryl. Great, great content. Uh, I, uh, because we are a small group that are gathered here, we, we're recording this for uh, others to be able to queue into on a later basis. But if you've got, got any questions, unmute yourself, ask your question, and uh, or let's start the discussion. Cheryl, I was intrigued a bit about the reciprocity between uh, whether or not a, a healthy family is a family is having meals together or they're having meals together because they're healthy and the and how those two feed each other. And I do think that that is something that if uh, if you guys are game that I think that we we probably need to explore a little bit more, uh, you know, perhaps together to see if that is uh, is something exactly what is the depth of that reciprocity and which one, you know, and not that we will ever solve the issue of the which came first, the chicken or the egg, but uh, but we will indeed, I think, find how they can uh, indeed feed each other, uh, no pun intended, but feed each other more actively, aggressively. I was intrigued by that. Yeah, and I do think that sometimes the, um, you know, it's the reality of um, our epidemiological research that it is really hard to get at, you know, sometimes the different ways that studies are conducted and different way things are defined that you sometimes find yourself limited in, in what you can say. But I do think as we develop more research, um, I think in some cases the, the fact that we can't necessarily say cause and effect at this point doesn't you know, mean that there isn't a significant association there, um, that we aren't seeing it. And, and what I'm seeing in the literature is that um, there's certainly no evidence of decreased um, uh, well-being with family meals, so that's a good thing. Um, and it's just a matter of degree. And I think, w will it be a matter of finding out, um, you know, is it a certain number of feet? And, and I imagine it's probably not that particular because every family is different. Um, and and I, I loved the FMI Foundations, you know, one more meal a week because, I wonder if research um, may find that it's a it's partly your baseline. You know, if you start from zero families or zero meals per week and you go to one, you know, that's an intentional act towards well-being for your family. Um, if you're a family that always eats meals together um, and you know you start to become interrupted by sport new sports schedules or maybe one of the parents has to take on a, a night job you know that kind of thing and it's unexpected um, you know how that's handled may be as important as you know the meals themselves um, so you know and, and I think I think this is where too nutrition um, has, it's important to provide healthful meals and it's important to not let perfection get in the way. Like if you feel like you can't do everything, sometimes it's more important just to sit down together, you know, um, and have that family time. Those are my thoughts, but I think the research has to be 
you know, just borne out a bit more. I'd love to hear others others thinking on that as well. Yeah. And Cheryl, we do have a, a question. I think this is coming from you, Barbara. Uh, yeah. Cheryl, can you comment on the age range of the women in this study? Um, age, okay, I actually have it right here. That's a great question, Barbara. Let's see, age. Um, I actually think that, um, I don't have it in front of me. I think this is looking, but I'll I'll look for it if we um, have any other discussion points, but that's a great question. I have um, another I, question. Huh? <laughs> uh, I do have another question. Yeah, go ahead. To tag on to that. Was there, were there any, um, was there a look at single parent homes versus, you know, yeah, two families, right. right, two parent homes or multi-generational, yeah, they, um, in this particular study, um, I don't see that borne out, but it may be that they're, um, they, they did collect the data and we'll see it in a, in a subsequent paper. Sure. Um, I do see education, um, I do, actually they have, um, they do have some data on a number of adults and children in the um, in the household. So, and they did not find significant differences along. They did um, they did find significant differences on that. So, um, I will actually um, find that data and get it to you, Barbara, because that's a great question. You know, kind of how they. Um, their ages and that sort of thing. It's just not at my fingertips. Good That's question. Okay. That's great. I, I was hoping I'd find it, but it's not jumping no out at me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Terrific thank information. You. Great study. Yep. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl and, and Barbara. Thank you for your questions. Those yes. were very helpful. Uh, and, but I'll also say that it's the ongoing um, issue that we try to help people define family as expansively as possible, uh, mm -hmm. where it's not just that nuclear uh, family, but it's also you can define it as you know inclusive of friends, of significant others, and such, and define it in that way. And in fact, some of our research yeah. has discovered that 17% of the population consider the pets to be part of the family meal. Uh, so that's uh, <laughs> I love as a pet that. owner, I'm always, always glad to they, find that out that people they also are part of the family that's yes, right they are, that's right. They are. <laughs> some people are more concerned about the nutritional value of their pets in terms yeah. of their pet <laughs> their, what they put in their own bodies but uh but anyway thank you cheryl so much for your your work and your words today and for um american heart association support of family meals efforts so thank you for yeah. helping to substantiate that uh and everyone I hope that you will join us next week, uh, same time, same channel, uh, when our third uh, Family Meals webinar will take place, and it, it will feature none other than the woman that was just on the screen a moment ago, uh, noted Family Meals uh, dietitian Barbara Barron, who is contributor to the book called Called uh, to to Lead, uh, Called to Lead, semicolon, success strategies for women. And Barbara will be sharing uh, some of her thoughts on Abadanza, uh, the chapter that she wrote on food, faith, uh, and family. So uh, please join us next week and we will uh, hear from Barbara. So thank you everyone for being here and have a great rest of your day and go enjoy a family meal.